Good morning. Our text this morning is Acts chapter 1. Acts 1. In the first book, O Theophilus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. When he had said these things, as they were looking on, he was lifted up, and a cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes, and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer, together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out. It became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called, in their own language, Akeldamah, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Let us pray. Righteous Heavenly Father, thank you for blessing us with our time together to worship you this morning. Thank you for this word that you have preserved about your apostles, the early church, We pray, Father, that as we study these stories about the early church, uh, that we discern your will for us today. We pray, Father, that we remain faithful to it, faithful to the pattern that you've laid down for us, uh, for the, the working of the church through all time. Thank you, Father, for the forgiveness that you have given us in Jesus. We pray, Father, that you grant us uh, graciousness as well as his grace. Uh, that we are as willing to forgive as he is. But we pray, Father, that you keep us in your way, uh, that we do not go astray as Judas did, uh, but rather remain faithful to you. We pray, Father, that you hasten the coming of our Lord. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. So today we are beginning a new series through the book of Acts. And I've chosen Acts for a couple of reasons. I mean, first off, it is one of the only New Testament books other than Revelation that I've not gone through with you uh, since uh, since I've been here. Uh, we've 
We've had at least one class on Acts before um, in the past few years, but it's always good to return to Acts uh, because, and this is the second reason uh, that I'm choosing to go through Acts now, Acts is where we see the pattern of the early church laid out most clearly. We receive a lot of instruction about the nature of the church in the epistles, um, but a lot of the instruction that we receive there is pretty incidental. Um, Acts, more than any other book of the Bible, is focused on the nature of the church. In fact, that was our Lord's focus over the 40 days that he taught the apostles after his resurrection. Right, Luke tells us, and it, it, bear in mind as we're entering into this study, uh, you, you probably gathered this from the very first verse, Acts is a, a sequel of sorts. It's a follow-on to the gospel according to Luke. And that's what Luke is referring to uh, in verse 1 as the first book. Um, he is referring to the gospel that he wrote, and he says in that, he dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, now he is going to continue the story. Um, continue the story past Jesus' resurrection, um, past the time that Jesus is taken up. Right. Notice that's what he says in verse 2, that he has, he's dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up uh, after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. So now he is going to pick up the story there and continue. And where he begins his story, uh, I guess recapping a bit, backtracking a bit, so he tells us that Jesus presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. One of the first things that strikes us about the kingdom in the book of Acts is that it operates according to authority. That's what I want us to focus on first. All right, Jesus chose to spend those 40 days after his resurrection and before his ascension. He chose to spend those 40 days instructing the apostles on the kingdom of God, that is, the church. And so it's worth our while to pay attention to this, since Jesus himself chose it as his focus and what we find the church doing is operating according to the authority that is placed over it. And first, we see the authority of Jesus himself. In the few verses where we read about Jesus before his ascension in this chapter, we read of Jesus not just providing instructions, but also issuing commands to the apostles through the Holy Spirit, ordering them not to depart from Jerusalem. And then Jesus gives the early church their plan. Right? He lays out, we, we might even call this the thesis statement of the book of Acts that we read in verse 8. Jesus tells them, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. That's Jesus' instruction for the apostles. And what we're going to find over the course of the book of Acts is that the apostles obey Jesus' command. They follow the pattern that Jesus laid out for them. Uh, they did it so well that this statement in verse 8 serves as an outline for the, the entire rest of the book. The first chapters of the book are dedicated to the apostles' work in Jerusalem. Then several chapters are dedicated to their witness in Judea and Samaria. And then the last two-thirds of the book focus on their witness to the ends of the earth. Because they're carrying out Jesus' plan in Jesus' way. Now, of course, Jesus himself doesn't stick around for the expansion of the early kingdom. We'll say more on that in just a moment. <coughs> but the apostles and the rest of the early church recognize another source of authority over their actions. All right, so first and foremost, they're listening to Jesus himself. But they also recognize the authority of the scriptures. 
Because after the ascension, the first thing that we find, what, 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 what is the first thing that we find the early church doing after the ascension? They are appointing a new apostle. And why are they doing that? Well, what does Peter say? The scripture had to be fulfilled. Now, consider this warning, by the way. Not even the apostles escape authority. Judas, we read, turned aside from his place. Right? He had a, he had a part and a share in this ministry. He had a path that was laid out for him, a, a track, as it were. The apostles have a job. They have a role to fulfill. And Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And for that, he is not counted among the apostles any longer. He has lost his place in the kingdom. In fact, Luke draws this startling contrast between Judas and Jesus in Acts chapter 1. Right? Jesus is raised from the dead. He's glorified. He's taken up into the clouds, leaving behind a group of around 120 people who are about to turn the world upside down. Right? But remember those things about him. He is alive again, no longer dead. He has been glorified. He has ascended and he has left something behind. Judas is dead, no longer alive. He is debased and condemned rather than glorified. Whereas Jesus ascended, we read that Judas cast himself down on the earth. And what does he leave behind? Nothing. As the scripture says, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. And so immediately in Acts chapter one, we see the stakes of obedience and loyalty to Christ. And as for the arrest of the apostles, Right? The scripture says, let another take his office. And so that's what they do. We find them obeying the instructions of Jesus, and we also find them obeying the instructions of the scriptures. They cast lots, and they appoint an apostle to replace Judas. All right. Now, we're going to have a lot more to say about apostleship as we go over the course of our study. <coughs> but for now, <coughs> let us turn our attention to the reason why another apostle was needed. Consider the qualifications that Peter lays out for who the next apostle is going to be, who's going to replace Judas. He says, so one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. Right, the job of an apostle was to bear witness to the life, ministry, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. And that's because the kingdom of God proclaims the risen Lord. The apostles formed the core of that witness. They were the ones who were actually there. They observed the ministry. They observed his suffering, his crucifixion. They observed his resurrection. And they shared that message with others, some of whom believed. And those new believers share the message with others so that they may believe. Right? This is a fundamental part of who we are. This is a fundamental part of what the kingdom is who the church is. We are the people who share the message of Jesus' ministry, suffering, death, resurrection, and ascension. And our witness rests on the witness of those who came before us, going all the way back to the original witnesses, the apostles. So the kingdom of God, the church of Christ, 
listens to the authority of Jesus, listens to the authority of the scriptures, bears witness along with the apostles to the work of Jesus. Notice, by the way, how much of this rests on Jesus. This is something I'd, I want us to, as we go through Acts, I want us to really notice this about the nature of the church, who the church is. What is the church is not primarily an historical question. It is not primarily a question of me in the year 2022 being able to trace things back historically through an unbroken line from myself to the apostles. Now, that line has to exist in some way. Right? I was taught the gospel, and the, person who, you know, the people who taught me the gospel were taught the gospel themselves, and they were taught the gospel, and it goes all the way back ultimately to the apostles. But it is not primarily an historical question. That's not what makes the church the church. Is being able to trace your history back through some unbroken line. What makes the church the church is not historical, but rather Christological. The church is the group of people who listen to the authority of Jesus Christ, who listen to the word of God, and who bear witness to the work of Jesus. But we want to notice one final thing about the kingdom in Acts chapter 1. And we'll conclude the lesson. The great event of Acts chapter 1 is Jesus' ascension into heaven. This is another, again, another part of the apostles' witness, another truth about our Lord that we bear witness to as the church. We believe that our Lord ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. We also believe what the angels say to the apostles in Acts chapter 1. This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. Now we learn elsewhere, both from our Lord and from the apostles, the writings of the apostles, we learn what this means. Right? That Jesus will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And so the kingdom proclaims not just Jesus' ministry, his crucifixion, his resurrection, his ascension. The church also proclaims his coming, the second coming of Jesus Christ. We proclaim the need for readiness against that day, the need for repentance, knowing that judgment is coming. We proclaim the need for lives of service in the kingdom of God. And that is what we call each of you to this morning. We invite everyone to believe in this good news, witnessed by the apostles and passed down to us through time, that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God, who gave himself as a perfect sacrifice for our sins, that he was raised on the third day, defeating death, that he has ascended to be at the right hand of the Father, and that he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Now, this is good news. Right? The good news is that we have, we have mercy. We have a chance. We have a gift that has been given to us in Jesus. What we invite you to do this morning is to receive that gift, to confess Jesus as Lord, to turn away from the life of sin, and to join him, become part of the kingdom of God by being baptized into Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. If you're subject to the invitation, won't you come forward as together we stand and sing.